everybody. Thanks for joining in with me again today. We are up to the letter J and um, we are going to talk today a little bit about the life of Joshua. Uh, Joshua's story spans quite a lot of uh, detail in the Bible. So I'm going to give you a picture review of where the, the story of Joshua actually begins. Joshua's story begins all the way back in Exodus because he was actually born in slavery in Egypt. He was part of the people that had to make bricks for Pharaoh. Um, God saw their anguish and raised up a mighty leader in Moses. So Joshua was alive at the point when he saw the plagues in Egypt. He also was alive at the point when he saw Moses um, working with the hand of God was able to part the Red Sea. So he was one of the ones that actually walked on dry land across the Red Sea. He was alive when Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. And he saw all of that happened when the people uh, got impatient of waiting for Moses. They, they crafted or under Aaron crafted a hideous golden calf and the people were worshiping it. He was there during that period of time and saw that happen. Um, he was a leader in his own tribe. So at this point, Joshua is not a boy. Uh, by the time they leave Egypt and travel over to um, the journey, he's, he's an adult man. I don't know exactly how old, but I would say, um, you know, late 20s, maybe 30-ish or somewhere in there, but old enough to be rising up in leadership and be a leader of his tribe. He was one of the ones selected to be one of the 12 spies to go into the promised land. We learned that when we studied the life of Caleb. Joshua and Caleb came back and said that the land was very rich, that it had, uh, these are the grapes, these great grapes that they brought from the Eshkol Valley. Um, unfortunately, the rest of the people, the other spies, were brought back a bad report and told the people that the people that lived in the promised land were giants and that they felt that they were no bigger than grasshoppers to them. So even though Joshua was eager and ready to go and he said, we can do this, God will give us this victory, we can have this promised land, but because of the other 10 men, that was not going to happen and the nation was turned away and sent to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So while they were in the wilderness, of course, he also ate manna because manna was the food that was provided by God for them. He also at this period of time in his life must have had to deal with the disheartening emotions that come with, with a, a dream not realized. Here they made it all the way out of Egypt, all the way through all those plagues, through the Red Sea, all the way up to the border, and then they can't go in. And then for 40 years, Joshua has to live with the tribes and go through all that went on in the wilderness experience because the nation was not ready to move forward. He saw Moses strike the rock. And, and get water. He was there when the people were complaining and mumbling and all of these things that Lot, that Joshua had to go through were training and preparation that God was putting him through so that at the end of his life when the mission was there for him to do, he had all of the necessary character inside of him. If he had gone directly from Egypt right to being the leader of the nation, he probably would not have had the ability that he needed to have. He wouldn't have had the experiences that he had. But all of these experiences gave him the faith that he needed to have so that Moses then anointed him to finish the task and take the people into the promised land. And it was no small task. By this point, I would say that Joshua would have been well into his um, 80s, maybe, old. He was not certainly, he, he spent 40 more years in the wilderness, so he was at least 80 or, or older. We don't know exactly how old, but certainly a seasoned vet who had seen all the things that God had done. The land was a land flowing with milk and honey. 
So we pick the story up here, and I've only selected a few things that went on in Joshua's life because it, it, it went through such a large period of time. In our short time together to study, we can't go over every single event that happened, but I have picked out some highlights. And we'll start with Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan River, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. So Moses has passed away. The mantle has fallen on to Joshua to lead the people into the promised land. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the river Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. Now we've talked about this before, that the promised land was much larger than what Israel is occupying now. It was supposed to go all the way over to the Euphrates River, which is in Iraq and all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, and all the way to the north of Lebanon, which is north of Israel. So there is no way they're occupying all of the land that God said that would be given to them at this point. God goes on to say, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The same words that Jesus said to us, before he went back to heaven, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So Joshua has to be strong, and he has to be courageous, because he's going to be successful. Now back in Deuteronomy, Moses had a lot to say with the people. Under his rule, they were very disobedient, they they whined and complained and they just were stiff-necked. They wanted to go back to Egypt and they really gave him a hard time. So in Deuteronomy 9, 6, Moses tells the people, therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. God isn't giving them the promised land because they earned it. He's giving them the promised land because God keeps his promises that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. So here you see a beautiful picture of grace in the Old Testament. They were going to be given this land that they didn't earn. They're going to be given this land that they didn't deserve. And the only reason that they were given this land or going to be successful was because it was a gift from God. This is what grace is, unmerited favor, receiving from God something that we didn't earn. The Lord said, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. So it, obedience is necessary for this to work. The, Joshua has to have great, great faith, the people have to have faith, but they also have to be obedient, and God is telling them that they have to do Moses' law. They can't turn from the left or the right. They must be obedient. This is very important that we know this. Joshua 1 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And this lesson applies to us even today. When we are weak and weary and frightened and afraid, we have to remember that this promise of God, all the way back in Joshua, all the way back as far as you want to go, is still relevant for us today. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days you will cross over this Jordan River to go to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. 
this requires preparation. Everything that God does for us requires preparation. The people just didn't rush right up to the border and then flood over there in a disarray. Everything has to be done in order. There has to be preparation. So Joshua gives them three days to get ready. Now, for those of you that are map people, I want to just show you this one thing. The Israelites were over here in Egypt. We don't know exactly where they passed over the Red Sea. They could have passed over here. They could have passed over somewhere in here. Most likely over here, possibly. Could have been up here and a little in here. We don't actually know. But we know that they ended up over here. And from here, they went north up here to the entrance of the promised land and failed with the 12 spies. So they went around and around and around for 40 years. They went into this wilderness and stayed there. At the end of the 40 years, they came back and went up the right side of the Dead Sea. Over here, see where Moab is? They're coming up on this side. And that's where we are now, but see Jericho? They're coming up right here and they're gonna cross over right by Jericho. That was a stretch for my arm there. Okay, so they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Notice what the people now are saying. The people are saying, we will do everything you command us. And we want God to be with you just like he was with Moses. So they're asking God's blessing on Joshua. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words and all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Here you see the population of the Israelites encouraging their leader. What they're saying to Joshua is only be strong and of good courage. Where Moses said that to them, and Joshua said that to them. They are saying this back to Joshua. They want Joshua to be strong and of good courage. So here we see the people encouraging their leadership, which is something that we should do. When we have leaders that are in charge of us and are working hard for us, we need to encourage them. We need to encourage our pastor. We need to encourage our leaders, whoever they are, because they're working hard for our benefit. Chapter 2 begins with this. Now Joshua the son of Nun set out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, who was lodged there. And we know the story, we probably heard it before, of uh, Rahab and the spies. And we're not going to do that story in this setting today. But yes, Rahab housed the spies gave them information that they needed, and they came back. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain and crossed over, and they came to Joshua the son of Nun and told him all that had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. Rahab told them that, that the city is scared to death because of the Israelites about ready to cross over the river. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from the Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Now the instructions that I have not recorded here for you, that the people are instructed to stay behind the Ark of the Covenant so that they can see where it's going because they have never gone this way before. So the priests take out with the Ark of the Covenant to go before the whole nation as it gets ready to cross over the river. Now they don't know at this point how they're going to get across the river. They just know that the place where they're going, they have to cross across the river. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. God's going to do a miracle that is going to help the Israelite nation to realize that God is with Joshua the same way he was with Moses. 
you shall command the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. Now when Moses parted the Red Sea, he put his staff in the water, and God caused a wind that caused the, the water to separate. Now in this case, the miracle is going to be a little tiny bit different because when the priest touch the water, the priests are going to stand in the Jordan water. And as, as it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that came down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. What, the, what this means is as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest step into the water, the water is going to stop flowing upstream. So when it does, all that water will go past and no more water will come. So that's what happened. The priests start into the water. And as they're standing at the edge of the water with their feet in the water, the water begins to stop. It stops upstream and everything flows down and the ground dries out. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priest who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the time of harvest. That's even more of a miracle because it wasn't just a little summer stream. This was a, this was a, uh, it had overflowed its banks. This is a deep, this is some deep water here. The water above that point began backing up a great distance at a town called Adam, which is near Zarathan, and the water below the point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. So this is the second time that God has parted the water. In case you didn't know this little, um, that this had happened in the book of Joshua. The priests have to stay in the riverbed. All the people get to go across. God tells, Moses, tells Joshua to have one man from each tribe to gather a rock from the riverbed and to place it at the edge of the river. And when they are, this is done, they'll pile them up and that will become a memorial there so that anyone that ever asks, will, would they will say to their children, this is where we crossed over the Jordan River and this is where God dried up the Jordan River. God wanted that to be a memorial for all time. So the water is backed up. People are coming across on dry land. Once everyone was across, the priests were instructed to come out of the water. And once they came out of the water, the water started to flow again as before. Now, when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Word came like lightning it, it went everywhere all the kings knew about it of course this big mob of people on the other side of the jordan river they already knew that they were there spies had they had spies everywhere they knew that this this multitude of people was poised on the right side of the jordan river well once the 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 word came that god had dried up the river to allow them to pass over they were scared to death because they knew that god was with the israelites from here Joshua went on to capture the city of Jericho, and that again is another Bible story to tell. How Joshua had the, everyone walk around the city and, and wait till the seventh time, and they blew the trumpet and the walls came tumbling down. So God gave the Israelites a military victory over the land of Canaan. Now in chapter 10, we find an interesting thing though that happened. Most of the chapters in Joshua are military conquest chapters. This city and that city and this city and that city. We get to chapter 10, we find that five of these kings of the Amorites joined forces and mounted an attack against the city of Gibeon that Joshua and the Israelites were responsible for and held. And the leaders of Gibeon sent word to Joshua begging for his help to help them withstand the attack. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including the best fighting men. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. 
The victory is already yours, Joshua. I've given them to you. None of them will be able to withstand you. So after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. So he, he went all night with the army, fighting men, and they surprised these Amorites who were about ready to besiege this city. The Lord threw the enemy into a panic, fighting against each other, most likely, and the Israelites slaughtered great numbers of them at Gideon. Then the Israelites chased them along the road to Beth Haran, killing them all along the way from Azekah to Mekedah. As the Amorites retreated down the road from Beth Haran, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven that continued until they reached Azekah. The hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites killed with the sword. So you see that God's hand is absolutely at work in this uh, conquest. Everything that Joshua needed, he was given by the Lord because the Lord, it was the battle was the Lord's. It was his, it was his purpose that they conquered this land. On the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajah. Agilon, I'm sorry. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a hit, about a full day. So the Bible indicates that this miracle occurred, that due to the battle, Joshua asked that the sun not set and that the moon not rise. And God did. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So God allowed the sun to stop and for the battle to be able to continue for Israel to win the day. From here, Joshua went on to capture other cities and territories and God gave the Israelites military victory over the land of Canaan. It was a long period of conquest lasting about five years. And we know that it was about five years because we, we have the um, passage that Caleb recounts that after they got to the promised land that it took, it was five long years of war. So after the land was subdued, God gave Joshua instructions on how to divide the land among the tribes, setting up cities of refuge, um, and setting up cities, especially for the Levites and that type of thing. The tabernacle was then set up at Shiloh and the people had a period of rest. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them and the Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled during Joshua's time. So at the end of his life, he gave the Israelites this final farewell address. And we don't know much about Joshua's personal life at all. We don't know anything about his family. We don't know uh, much of his anything about him other than the things that he saw and the things that he was in, the history that he was involved in. But he says to them at the end of his life, now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. That's important for us to remember. God fulfilled every promise that he made to them, every single one. And we can be comforted by that because every promise that he made to us will be fulfilled when he said i am going to prepare a price for you and if i do i will come and return and bring you to myself so that you can be where i am i haven't quoted that just perfectly but all of those promises god will fulfill exactly as he says so that's joshua says that to the people there every promise has been fulfilled not one has failed but just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened 
until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you if and there's that if word if you violate the covenant of the Lord your God so this is a conditional covenant that they're still living under we've talked about this many times before in order to maintain the blessings that they have and to stay in the land they have to stick with the covenant they have to have no other gods before Jehovah God no idols if you violate the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you and go and serve other gods and bow down to them the Lord's anger will burn against you and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you so after these things Joshua son of Nun the servant of the Lord died at the age of 110 and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim north of Mount Gash Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the and, and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel so under the leadership of Joshua Israel obeyed and after Joshua died while the elders that were responsible still lived Israel still obeyed of course when they died off what happened they started to slip again into idolatry they started intermarrying and different things going on and they fell into they fell out of the covenant so what can we learn from the life of Joshua first of all I would have to say that he saw the mighty miracles of God and he believed he was lucky he got to see God in action in so many ways think back to the pictures that I showed you at the beginning of this uh, presentation he saw the Red Sea parted he saw the Jordan River parted he saw the plagues in Egypt he saw the manna from heaven he saw water come out of the rock he saw all of those things and every single time a miracle occurred it cemented Joshua's faith it built his faith number two he made a firm commitment in his mind to stick to what he believed even when the way seemed lost after he was a spy and came back and scouted out the land and he wanted to go in the disappointment of not being able to have that could have caused him to lose faith but he never did he stuck with what he believed in so that when the time came for him to assume the responsibilities he was ready number three he faithfully fulfilled his job as an assistant to Moses that was important he was an assistant to Moses and he faithfully did what Moses asked him to do he was a faithful leader of his own tribe and then he became a courageous military leader for the whole nation finally accomplishing the task started by Moses and number four Joshua stands as a model for us because he rose from a life of slavery he lived a life dedicated to belief in God through tremendous hardship in the wilderness. He trusted God completely for the victory and he was successful and victorious. One of the main verses that come from the book of Joshua is in a very important verse. Um, years ago, um, well, even so today, there are, there are many places that you can buy this Bible verse in a platform to hang on your wall I have this hanging on my wall I've had it on my wall since I was in my 20s and it says choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell or but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord and many times you'll see that the plaque will say choose you this day whom you will serve as for me and my house we will serve the Lord this is the choice you have to make you have to decide whether you and your household are going to serve the Lord or whether you're not now if Joshua could reach out across time to us as a message from the Old Testament he would say to us this same thing do not be afraid do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go and from the New Testament Paul reaches out to us and says this same idea therefore my dear brothers and sisters stand firm let nothing move you 
Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. I know in this time that we're living in, it's extremely worrisome. The epidemic is raging very bad in certain parts of our country. Our nation is not at rest. There's a lot of turmoil and I know that we're, we're frightened and we, most of us, if you're like me, you can't see the end of this. You don't know what's going to happen or how this is ever going to work out. Is life ever going to be normal again? But if you listen to these Bible verses and you look at the life lived by other Christians before us, you can see that there is a future. There is hope. God is still in control. And if we are diligent and diligent to prayer, diligent to read the Bible and study, we can be encouraged and we need to encourage each other. At different periods of time, you're gonna have a friend that needs encouraging or a family member. They, they are, uh, maybe things aren't going well. Jobs could be lost, money lost, people sick. We don't know what those things could be, but we need each one of us to be a warrior in the encouragement army. And I encourage you to do that. That's the very one simple thing we can all do for each other. Encourage each other. Just like Joshua says, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God is with us today, right now, in this place, and will be with us wherever we go. So let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, at times we are afraid, and it does us good to read these Old Testament Bible stories and just look at the victory that you gave Joshua in his lifetime. Look at the miracles that, that he was able to see. And Lord, there are miracles still in the world where we are today. We just have to open our eyes to them. Help us to hold steady and be strong. Help us to stay in prayer and be real encouragers to each other. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, friends, till I see you again next week, we're going to be looking at letter K. Now, there's not a lot going on with letter K, so I would be curious to see what you decide might be a good choice. So send me an email. In the meantime, God bless you and have a very good week. Bye-bye.